Hi, I'm Shannon, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN. This week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion on Richard Nixon's 1968 campaign. Chapman University professor Luke Nichter discusses the issues with that year's presidential election. Class starts right after this. Hi, I'm Tammy, and joining me today is Paul, as we celebrate 45 years of C-SPAN's unblinking eye on the democratic process. That's right, Tammy. Since our founding in 1979, C-SPAN has been documenting history with a unique approach, unfiltered, without commentary, and entirely independent from government funding. C-SPAN is funded by fees from our cable and satellite distribution partners, and now with fewer people subscribing to cable and satellite, we're asking you to help support our next 45 years. It's amazing to see how C-SPAN has adapted and grown. With the rise of digital platforms and social media, C-SPAN has expanded its reach. So no matter where you are, you have 24-7, 365 access to the democratic process. And as we navigate this ever-changing media environment, C-SPAN's dedication to putting you in the rooms where politics is debated and policy is determined will not waver. We ask you to support C-SPAN's vital mission. As we celebrate 45 years of service, your contribution helps us to continue to adapt and grow in this digital age. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your contribution today. Here's to 45 more years of bringing democracy directly to you wherever you get your news. Thank you for your support. Visit cspan.org slash donate today to make a difference. All right, welcome back. Uh, we, so last time, if you remember, where we, where we left off, we were president 64 presidential election and the 68 midterms. And today we move on in our reading uh, from Evan Thomas on chapters 9 and 10, which really takes us sort of into the 68 campaign. And by the end of this class, Richard Nixon will be the president. So we've been waiting a long time uh, to get to that point uh, since January. So to recap from last time, 64 was a terrible year for Republicans, one of the four great landslides of the 20th century where Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater lost, uh, was defeated by incumbent President Lyndon Johnson. So a terrible year for Republicans. Conservatives, however, would call it a great year, 1964. And remember we talked, conservatives were Democrats, conservatives were Republicans. They were divided, it's different than it is the parties are configured today. And in 64, if you're a conservative, and there still are a few Goldwater conservatives around, and, and we ask them today, kind of talk, talking about 64, they don't talk like they, they went over the cliff with Goldwater. They get this sort of twinkle in their eye and the smile, and this was a wonderful year to be a conservative because it was really the year that conservatives exerted themselves. Not only did they get a true conservative nominated for the first time in modern US politics, but they realized that rather than be divided in the two parties, some of us are in Democrats, some of us are Republicans, the, the nomination of Goldwater was a signal to conservatives that they belonged in the Republican Party in the future. And so it be, began this process. It just started earlier, but it was important, especially in 64, with Strom Thurmond switching parties from the Democrats to the Republicans. Uh, former actor Ronald Reagan came out and endorsed a prominent Democrat, labor union leader, uh, going back to the 40s and the 50s endorsed Goldwater and had his famous A Time for Choosing speech, which is interesting, you could watch it, it's on YouTube. It's about 30 minutes long, so we, don't have, we can't watch it in class. And it began the process of, of the political winds gradually shifting in the South. And today we find ourselves in another shift that we don't have the perspective yet to see what's going on. So after Goldwater, the South begins to shift Republican. And today something else is going on. You know, I think, is Georgia gonna remain Republican? Is, is Virginia going to remain Republican? And this it's, it's started earlier. Remember, we, Eisenhower won Virginia both times I, in, in 52, Eisenhower, Nixon. Eisenhower, Nixon in 1956 won Louisiana. So it really began to chip away at the traditional Democratic South, which was a stronghold. And so 64, again, a terrible year for Republicans, a great year for conservatives in terms of their prospects in the future. And then 66. The, the, the lopsided loss by Republicans in 64, they almost gained, they gained back almost everything they lost in 64 during the midterms in 66, in terms of the House, in terms of the Senate, in terms of governors, in terms of state house seats coast to coast. Democrats were still in charge. Democrats held the White House with Lyndon Johnson. They still controlled the House and the Senate after the 66 midterms, but Republicans had made it considerably close. Uh, and uh, erasing the losses of 64, 
and, sh and building momentum as they move toward 1968. And so that's where we be begin today. As we know from, from previously, Nixon had a good life in New York City. For the first time, he was making money. He wasn't a public official. He was practicing law, a named partner at one of Wall Street's most important white shoe law firms with some of the biggest corporate clients you could have uh, of any law firm in, in the country, right around the corner from, from Wall Street in lower Manhattan in New York. And I think uh, as much as he wanted to get back into the arena, as he called it, into politics, his wife, Pat Nixon, was happy to be away from politics. His daughters, for the first time, had a kind of normal childhood, if you can call that normal, having your dad as vice president living in Manhattan uh, around the corner from Central Park. But they were, you know, they were teenagers. They were reaching teenagers, late teens, early 20s, like many of you, an important age you know, to be able to be creative and have time and, and grow intellectually. And so really the first time in their lifetimes, being born in the 1940s, anything approaching a family life that, that was normal or had any kind of consistency to it. Yet Nixon said, and I think it was in Pat Buchanan's book, The Greatest Comeback, and, and also cited otherwise, that he thought within a few years he would be, he would be dead intellectually. He, the practice of law didn't stimulate him. And ultimately he would be dead physically if this went on for too much longer. So I think he was eager to get back into politics. So sort of testing the waters in 64, and it didn't really go anywhere. 66, becoming a more prominent, out of office, but campaigning for hundreds of Republicans and accurately predicting the wins they had that, that fall and racking up all kinds of favors to be cashed in later, you know, should he make. And you know, if, you, if you hustle around the country and take photo ops and campaign with every House candidate and Senate candidate and they win, you know, they remember that you were there for them uh, and you, you rack up all kinds of political favors to be cashed in later. So the, the decision to run in 1968 was not an easy one. And try for a moment to take yourself out of 2024 and put yourself in the perspective of Richard Nixon in, say, 67 or 68. Campaigns then were shorter. They're not like now, where it seems like campaigns never really end. We have an election today, and the new campaign begins tomorrow, it seems like today. It was different then. Presidential campaigns began about a year in advance. So, so a presidential campaign in 68 would really start just before the New Hampshire primary in 68. January, February is when you really have to, to make up your mind because you have to either collect signatures or get on the ballot in those primaries. You know, similar today with 2024, the sort of gamesmanship of, of uh, even for uh, incumbent President Biden and for Donald Trump, there's a certain gamesmanship about which primaries do you really invest in heavily, which ones do you campaign personally, you know, where do you pick and choose and strategize. And so Nixon was very much in that situation in 67. I think wanting to get back in, but also wanting to make a reversible decision should he change his mind and, and, and not jump in as he did in 1964. And uh, so this was, I tell this story a bit in my, my last book, which came out in the fall, which is on the 68 election. So I'm gonna go beyond the reading here a little bit. Nixon decides in late 67, he doesn't know what to do. And so he retreats to Key Biscayne, Florida, kind of one of the very first Keys in the Florida Keys, one of the northernmost ones, just sort of south or southeast, I guess, of Miami Beach, kind of separated by a, a causeway. Still there today, a beautiful place to go. Great if you're a tennis fan, they got a big tennis stadium there. Beautiful lighthouse and state park system that you can walk down to. That was all there during Nixon's time. And that's where he went to reflect, kind of away from the city. And he, he, he had had friends in South Florida like uh, B.B. Rebozo and... Um, uh, Senator George Smathers was a Democrat, but a moderate Democrat, who always welcomed Nixon to come and visit and keep his game. And this is a picture of, of the compound that, uh, that Nixon stayed at when, when he was there, kind of the front and the back. And it was, I remember I went there a few years ago, it was around 2011, and you could, they, they actually were, tear, a lot of these old Floridian homes were being torn down and mansions were being built in their place. In 2011, when I drove by, it was sort of, they tore down both homes, and it was sort of a double lot, huge sort of Italian mansion, which, which is kind of a shame, but inevitable. And if you're standing uh, where, where you see the front of the house here, if you could stand just to the side and see where the, the, the ocean is, the, the bay, right on the right-hand side, what you would see today is this dramatic skyline of Miami, like right there, like South Miami. So it's a really impressive place to be. I mean, it's striking when you visit it. 
And in 2011, when I drove by, anytime I'm in the area, I kind of drive by and see what's new in that neighborhood. Um, the, the houses were gone, but the presidential helipad that was done during the presidency was still there, which is kind of off to the side, you know, down here. Uh, so that's really the one last artifact that's left from that time period, where Nixon went to go retreat in late in 67. And I think he really didn't know what to do. Remember, he had lost, he had lost narrowly for the presidency in 1960, it, and it's, the narrow victories, believe it or not, are really the tough ones. Because anything you could have done, you, you question yourself much more. You know, if you're defeated de decisively, there's a lot less what if going on. Like if I'd only done this, or I'd only done that. But when you lose narrowly, that sticks with you forever. You know, if I'd only made one more trip to the East Coast, or one more trip to some primary which I knew I cut short. You know, the close ones are really tough. Uh, the Humphrey campaign, when I talked to the Humphrey people for the book, 68 for them, that is really tough. It's, it's really, it sticks with you. And you continue to sort of fight it in your own mind. Like, why did we lose? Like, that was unfair. So that was Nixon in 60. That was really emotional to, to lose. He, he'd never lost before in politics. And in 62, losing in more humiliating fashion, as we discussed before, for the California governorship, that was a more decisive loss. Nixon at that point was a loser in politics. You don't usually come back. Politics does not guarantee a second act. In fact, it's rare you get a second act. And so Nixon, even in his own party, was considered a loser. I think Nixon thought himself that he was not only a loser, but Nixon in his own memoirs say, I was a sore loser by 68. You remember that whole last press conference thing he did in 60, 62? Uh, gentlemen, you're not going to have Nixon to kick around anymore. I mean, he, could, he called himself a sore loser in his own memoirs, which is not usually a place you look for criticism of someone you know, in, the, in, their own, in their own writings. And so he really doubted himself in 67. He thought, he, we wasn't sure that he could survive a third loss. You know, what would that put the family through? And also history showed there, wasn't, there was no precedent for this. I mean, you could look in more recent history, you know, Tom Dewey running twice you could, for the Republican Party you, and losing both times. You could look at Adlai Stevenson in 52 and 56 in the Democratic Party losing twice. You, you're done after two losses. Usually you don't even get a second chance. I mean, even in more modern politics, it's very rare that a defeated nominee, it, it, you, there, no one thinks, oh, they'll, be, they, they'll have another chance in four years. No, we're moving on, you know, in, in both parties. And you know, you have to go back a ways. You could go back to like Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate who ran four times in the opening years of the 20th century, including in 1916. He's the closest parallel if, if Donald Trump were to be convicted and go to jail, and I'm not suggesting that's a great possibility, but in 1916, Woodrow Wilson made sure Debs ran from jail and he still won a million votes. Uh, with a lot smaller population. So I if you run for office and go to jail, you still have a path forward, you know, potentially. So you, you can be redeemed. But you know, maybe William Jennings Bryan is an example. Beginning in 1896, he ran a handful of times. He was a Democratic nominee, but never had redemption and never actually won, but was the nominee several times beginning in 1896. So it wasn't clear how, how Nixon was, was going to have a path forward. So he's down in Key Biscayne thinking, what do I do? And he doesn't know what to do. So he calls his friend, Reverend Billy Graham. Graham, um, the picture, first picture I'll show you is later in 68. This is a, Graham had a, um, a crusade rally. You can almost see the very last letters of the word Pittsburgh. Uh, so they're at the stadium in Pittsburgh. And so Nixon says to Graham, I don't know what to do, whether I should run. Would you please come down and counsel me on this decision? And uh, th this is a fascinating part of the story that really wasn't on the public record until my book came out. So the, the, the Grahams allowed me to use Billy Graham's diary in this book. And it's the first book to use the diary. And the diary is fascinating. Uh, it's, what I do in the book is not even fair. It's really sort of the edge of the tip of the iceberg. So Graham died in 2018 at age 99, and the diary has verbatim content with presidents, their staffs, and their tops, uh, and, and families, beginning in 1950 with Harry Truman to Barack Obama in 2014. Like, think about that for a second. Content of conversation, I would say it's part scrapbook, part diary, some part of it's handwritten, more like a traditional diary, some part of it is, uh, was dictated and then typed up later. I'm going to show you a page, a couple pages from that today of, of the 68 campaign, which was used in the book. Some part of it might be 
It might be like a White House lunch menu where Graham might have scratched something on it in his handwriting the president said to him or something that he said to the president. But this is a unique resource on the presidency that's not in the National Archives, not in a, any presidential library. So you're going to be hearing, if you follow presidential politics or history at all, you're going to be hearing more about this diary. So enough about that. Graham comes down and, and has assumed that Nixon was, was going to run. Why wouldn't you? I mean, I, you don't have to be a complete cynic like me to believe that politicians work so hard to acquire power and the chance to maintain power, they don't give it up until it's clawed forcefully away from them. I mean, LBJ is a good example. I mean, LBJ was not, was, was not going to give that up, you know, unless he really had to or unless he doubted himself. And, and Graham, um, so Graham came down. The, the trouble with Graham is, um, so Nixon says, come down and, advise, and counsel me on what to do. And Graham says, I can't. I'm not well enough to travel. Graham had canceled all of his schedule. He had viral pneumonia. He went to Atlanta to receive an award, and he checked into the, to a Holiday Inn uh, just outside of Atlanta. Uh, and, and he was going to stay there for as long as it took to feel better. He said, no, I'm not well enough to travel. I've canceled my whole schedule. I'm not even going to go home. He lived outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, until I get better. And so Nixon said, uh, Nixon said I will send a private plane. I need, uh, I need you to come to keep us game. Like, this is important. And so Graham wrote in his diary something like, well, I guess there's things that are more important than health. And so Graham, Graham, Graham goes down. Uh, and, and I'll come back to the, the just, just a minute. Graham is important for another reason, as Nixon makes this decision in late 67. A couple of months before Hannah Nixon, Hannah Nixon died, This is actually, I don't have a photo from um, Mrs. Nixon's funeral, because obviously she's in this. This is when Frank Nixon died in, in 56. The brothers, the youngest, Ed, escorting their mother here in uniform in the foreground. Two months before, Hannah Nixon had died. So Frank had passed away in the 50s when Nixon was vice president. And in 67, in the fall, Hannah Nixon had died. And Hannah Nixon was the one more than anyone else, but Graham also, who encouraged Nixon, you'll get another chance to run. You have to do it. You know, don't, don't give up. And a lot of sort of writers of Nixon will refer to this as kind of like the voice of Hannah, like at certain moments in Nixon's career, sort of the voice of Hannah, which might actually have been her voice or something inside of him, you know, that inspired him, you know, to keep going. And so Graham helped to officiate at her funeral in 67 and was there. And, and, and like Hannah, you know, Graham said, you're, you're going to get another chance. You know, Graham, Graham believed that, that Nixon, Nixon was still young. I mean, in 67, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was 54 years old, just turned 54. So certainly it's very young by today's standard of politics on either side of the aisle. So he, Nixon, had, Nixon had the luxury, unlike most politicians, of he could wait, he could choose his political timing to make a reentry to politics. So Graham came down and um, officiated and, and like Hannah, I think Nixon felt after her death that, that he, something in his mind told him that he had to do it for her. He had, he had to run for her as a way of kind of redeeming that she didn't live to see him run again. But I think, I think that's a factor you know, in, in his thinking at that time. So Graham at the time, we're going to go back to Graham. Uh, Graham at the time uh, was really closer to, um, uh, to LBJ. That was the next photo here I skipped over before. This is Graham in Johnson's Oval Office in September of 1968. They were similar in lots of ways. And we talked about Johnson before, not really being a true Southerner, really being, and the, the family considered him to be more Southwestern. When he was born in 1908 in Gillespie County in, in Texas, that was a weird place in the South to be from. Uh, it, high German immigration meant it was less Baptist than the rest of the South. It also meant it was more open to outsiders and foreigners and people who were not Southern. It was not pro-Confederacy or pro-slavery. It, it tried to stay out of controversy, but really it was against those things. I mean, it's just sort of this unique enclave where Johnson came from and made him different than a typical Democratic Southerner. I mean, it'd be easy for us to stereotype what it means to be a Democrat from the South, a conservative. And Johnson doesn't quite fit that very well. And that's similar to Graham. Graham's from North Carolina, so also sort of the fringes of the South. A part of the country, remember Eisenhower Nixon got Virginia twice and Louisiana, both parts of the fringes of the South that were beginning to come into play pol politically. 
and possibly shift to the Republican side. Graham considered himself to be a lifelong Democrat, but that didn't mean that's how he voted all the time. He probably was a split ticket voter. I, I, he, he talks about voting for Eisenhower, but maybe statewide would have gone Democrat down the rest of the ballot. And so Graham, Graham really voted the person and not the party. He wasn't loyal to a political party. Uh, and of course, he, and, he, and he tried to stay out of politics as much as, and here I've shown you his pictures with politicians, but Graham didn't want to affect his ministry. I mean, his real, his real goal was to expand his ministry. And so he tried, he, he might do political things, but he really avoided partisan things, which is slightly different. And so Graham never really, and Graham would, would suggest kind of who he preferred, but he never came out and would use the word endorsement. He kind of, he, he tried to avoid that. And so in, in 67, uh, according to Graham's diary, Johnson told Graham, Graham was one of the only ones apparently Johnson told, that LBJ was not likely to run again in 1968. And apparently, from what we can tell, Graham passed that along to Nixon. So imagine, take that into consideration in terms of do you want to run again and who are you likely to face in 1968? Nixon didn't believe him. I think Nixon was like, like what I suggested, the cynic, who says no one gives up political power until they have to. And there'd been no precedent. Harry Truman stepped down voluntarily in 1952 when faced with running against General Eisenhower. So I guess that's the closest analog, but that was, that was a little bit different. So Graham and Johnson were, were, were similar, and, and because of that, in 1968, Graham knew all the players, and he, he had been longtime friends with Johnson, he'd been longtime friends with Nixon, I think he met him in the Senate dining room in 1950. He had known Hubert Humphrey, vice president, for a long time, because Graham's ministry actually started in Minneapolis when Humphrey was mayor. I mean, really, the stars were aligning for Graham to be important. He knew Eisenhower, who was in retirement still. Uh, he dies in uh, March of 69, so he is, he's weak in 68 and living most of the year at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington. But his endorsement is still extremely powerful because Eisenhower is a really popular and, and beloved figure. So Graham in 68 knows all of the key people involved, I would say almost an average of 20 years, 68. He's a unique figure in the country who can be a liaison between them and pass messages and see what they're thinking. He even knew George Wallace, the third party candidate in 68, and thought he called, in his diary, called Wallace one of the greatest orators of the 20th century. His ability to sort of attract followers. We'll talk more about Wallace and kind of his anti-elite, anti-establishment candidate, which I think both parties have mimicked since then, but especially on the Republican side of the aisle because of Donald Trump is really making a similar kind of anti-elite, anti-establishment, kind of blue collar, lower middle class outreach you know, to those voters. So Graham is a fascinating figure. So I'll show you a couple pages from the diary. Don't feel the temptation to try to read it. I'll, I'll draw your attention to a couple passages you know, that, 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 I wanna, um, uh, that I wanna talk about. So Graham had a long dictation about this time period. Again, let's reset the scene. He's down in Key Biscayne with Nixon and trying to help Nixon answer the question, what do I do? Do I run or not? Who am I gonna run against? You know, what am I getting myself into you know, a third time? And so this is all new information that's in the book that, that was uh, from the Graham Diary. And oh, going ahead to 68. So Nixon, Nixon begins to, Nixon decides, he sort of begrudgingly he's going to run. But what I wanna show you here is the role that Graham played in 68 and I think I think my conclusion is that Graham was the most important person in 1968, except for some, those who were on the ballot in 68, and maybe outgoing President Lyndon Johnson. I mean, he played a, a very important role back and forth. So I'm, I'm getting forward a, a little bit. Um, June, Robert Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy is assassinated in June, has the funeral mass at St. Patrick's in New York City, a huge gathering of the political class, celebrities, uh, even people who didn't know him necessarily. I, I mean, it was a real occasion of, of national mourning. And Johnson, of course, is going, I believe jo Johnson's, I think, entire cabinet went, uh, probably a quorum of the Senate. They probably could have had a Senate session there if they wanted to. And a huge, maybe a third of the House Representatives. I mean, it was a huge gathering. Uh, I'm not even sure if such a gathering today with Secret Service would be possible. They would want that many people all in one place. And so um, Graham attends. Graham. Graham didn't know Robert Kennedy, but he knew Teddy, Teddy Kennedy, the younger brother. And he was fond of the Kennedy family and obviously understood that that's two Kennedys who were killed in five years. John F. Kennedy in 63 was assassinated in Dallas. 
and then Robert Kennedy uh, on the night following the California primary and the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles in June of 68. But what I'm trying to show you here with these pages is the role that Graham played you know, throughout that year. So um, Graham sees Johnson at the funeral at St. Pat's and Johnson says, after, you're, after we're done here, would you mind coming down to the White House to advise me to, uh, and to hold some kind of a, a service for the staff who are really affected by this, as, as, as Americans were? And so Graham says, of course. So the Graham diary talks about, I, I came down to Washington right afterwards from New York. He says in his diary something like, it was one of the most depressing flights I've ever taken because it was full of Robert Kennedy's former staffers. I got to the White House, I checked into my usual room at the White House. I mean, who has a usual room at the White House? Uh, and I believe his diary says room 304, so the third floor of the mansion. That shows you how close he was to the, to the Johnsons. And he was a regular overnight guest at the White House. And then the passage I'll pick up is the next morning. So he gets down on the 8th, uh, and the next morning, Sunday, June 9th, he, so he is LBJ, he called on the telephone rather early and invited me to come to, down to his bedroom. I had been in his bedroom both at the White House and at the ranch on a number of occasions. It was here in the quietness of early morning hours that I had learned a great deal about President Johnson and the state of the world. Many times he gave me confidences and the secrets of state. He knew from past experience that I would not pass them on. It had been my policy always never to quote the president. He understood that one of his secrets was safe with me. Many times he did not ask my advice on the matters that he discussed with me. He was either just trying to tell me his point of view on a certain issue, or he just wanted someone to talk to. On this particular morning, he mentioned politics, which was very rare in his conversations with me. He said that he thought Richard Nixon was going to be elected the next president of the United States. This is June of 68, so about five months before people voted, when it was anything but clear that Nixon was going to win. He said, Nixon is probably the best qualified man in America to be president. He said, I don't always agree with him, but I respect him for his tremendous ability. I told him if he gave me freedom to tell Mr. Nixon just what he had said, that it would be of great encouragement to him. He said, by all means, tell him. So beginning in June, Graham is effectively a, mass, mass, a secret messenger between uh, LBJ and Nixon, and someone that never would have been suspected by West Wing media or press. Uh, he was kind of the ideal spy, you know, if you want to use that word, you know, not, not as a pejorative. Uh, John, Johnson, and, and Johnson and Nixon came to realize they needed each other in 1968. As much of America watched the chaos of that year unfold on their televisions, the surprise Tet Offensive attack in Vietnam against our, our forces at a time when Americans were told the war was going better how could this simultaneous coordinated attack be possible? The North Korean seizure of the USS Pueblo crew held captive and being negotiated for another year. You had uh, Eugene McCarthy's senator from Minnesota, stunning entry into the race to challenge Lyndon Johnson, the first to, occur to challenge Johnson, almost winning the New Hampshire primary against LBJ. And then shortly after that, the entry of Senator Robert Kennedy, the second major challenger from within Johnson's own party. So that's a difference from six, there are a lot of similarities with 68. That's, that would be a difference for today in terms of, you know, when at sort of the senator level, a prominent challenger, you know, other than Dean Phillips and some lesser candidates have really come forward to challenge Johnson. Uh, and and, and uh, so the, the primaries, Kennedy's 100 day campaign you have then the, the twin assassinations of that year, uh, which I just started to, uh, to allude to and now uh, s talk about it more fully. Uh, Martin Luther King assassinated on the balcony outside of his hotel room in Memphis at the Lorraine Hotel, which is now a National Park Service. It's a great place to visit if you like civil, uh, civil rights sites. It's a historic site. Uh, King is assassinated in April and it, it, it stuns the nation that this figure who could be for moderation and nonviolence, or we talked about King being chosen to pastor a church in Montgomery, Alabama, because he was a moderate. He wasn't one of the ones. He wasn't a Black Panther, and he wasn't encouraging violence. He did become a little more interested in direct action in the last couple of years of his life, but it always been kind of a figure for moderation, someone who could work with both sides, since his I Have a Dream speech in 1963 at the, at the, in front of the Lincoln Memorial. So King is assassinated in, in April and it stuns the nation. 
Kennedy's assassination in June stuns the political class. And so while, while King's is the precursor to arson and looting and violence in 100 American cities that summer in 68, after Kennedy's, it was almost sort of an eerie calm descended on the nation. And, and Johnson, in the midst of this, was trying to figure out, Johnson had withdrawn from the race on television on March 31st. He had given a speech that otherwise was about Vietnam. And at the very end of it, he had a final couple lines, which he'd, he'd been carrying around in his jacket pocket since the beginning of the year, but had not had the courage to use those final lines. He actually was planning to use them at the end of the State of the Union. And so he had these final lines ready uh, that I will not accept, you know, he will not accept the, the term of office, he will not accept the nomination of his party in 68. He'd had that ready to use at the end of a speech. He chickened out for various reasons in the State of the Union, but he used it on March 31st in a speech that was otherwise about Vietnam and responding to the Tet Offensive and a general sort of assessment about Vietnam. He has this stunning ending that he only notified a few people about an hour before he was giving the speech. His vice president, Hubert Humphrey, was in Mexico uh, signing a treaty the next day. And he was called just before and told, you better turn on the radio and, and, and listen for this. And so Johnson, Johnson is out. Uh, and, and we haven't had that since. And a lot of people today are asking, you know, could President Biden do something similar? Uh, it happened in 68 with Johnson. It happened in 52 with Harry Truman. So there are a lot of similarities, but there are also differences. In 68, when a president withdraws, it's a wide open election. It's pandemonium. First thing first, the incumbent president is immediately considered a lame duck. All the spotlight shifts to everybody else. You have very little hope to do anything in your remaining 10 months of office, you know, or whatever it is. All the excitement shifts to the challengers. And what I document in the book is something different. For 50 years, people assumed Johnson was a lame duck and not important after that. The Graham Diary and some other records that are in the book show otherwise, that Johnson has simply shifted his energies from the ballot, which he had withdrawn from, to influencing the choice of his successor, ultimately. And so the most controversial argument in the book is documenting a pattern of activities where Johnson actually came to prefer Nixon, a Republican, as a successor. And so, it, you know, it, 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 so it's, it's a very different story than what's been written before. Um, I, I think we'll, I'll, I'll get out of that. So the one more message I'll talk about Graham, and then we'll get back to talking about 68. This is a little bit faded. Again, don't, don't uh, te have the temptation to try to read it. I'll, I'll tell you what's on the page in just a minute. So this message is continued, starting in June, between Johnson and Nixon. Nixon also goes to, has uh, Graham go down and see Wallace in Alabama. The head of the Republican delegation in North Carolina is wavering a little bit on Nixon, and Graham is again used to twist his arm a little bit and stay loyal to Nixon. Graham is, is very involved you know, throughout the campaign. And these messages continue to be passed back and forth between all the major players. This is a second one. Uh, there's more that we could talk about, but we just don't have time. This is the second one I want to talk about. In September, so September is the traditional kickoff for the campaign back then. Can we lose dis this distinction today when campaigns are going on all the time? But typical campaigns back then would kick off around Labor Day, like the Monday after Labor Day. You'd have a big opening rally. You're kind of throwing it into gear, you know, and you'll stay in that gear you know, all the way till November on Election Day. So right after uh, Labor Day in 68, Graham is that rally that I showed you. We'll go back to that picture for a minute. That rally in Pittsburgh, whoops. This is just after Labor Day. Graham, as far as I can tell, this was just coincidental, is in Pittsburgh for a series of rallies. And Nixon is in town for another reason. He has a political rally. They're staying at the same hotel, the Pittsburgh Hilton. And Nixon is staying one floor above Graham in the same hotel. And they have breakfast on a Sunday morning at the hotel. And during, during the, the meeting, uh, Nixon says, would you be willing to pass another message to Johnson? And Graham says, sure, let me take out a piece of paper. And Nixon says, you're the only one that can do this, you know, to go to the White House. And Graham had been to the White House many times. I don't know if he'd ever asked for a meeting, you know, with the president. Like, can I come in on Friday? Well, in fact, Graham was asked, well, what's the purpose of the meeting? I can't tell you. Uh, I mean, imagine trying that out. Like, try calling the White House. I need to see the president on Friday. 
for let's say a half hour, well, what's the purpose? I, it's private, I can't, I, I can't get into that. That's what Graham did. And that shows you the access he had you know, to both, unique. I don't know that there's another figure like Graham today you know, in America, I mean, there might be, but we don't, we're not aware of it because we only became aware of this you know, many years later. And so the previous image that I showed you was, um, uh, was uh, the, the notes that, that Graham took. There we go, one more. These are, this is a, an image from the Graham diary of the notes that Graham took when meeting Nixon at the Pittsburgh Hilton in September that he carried into the Oval Office to see Johnson that following Friday. So they sit down. That was the photo that I showed you of LBJ and Graham sitting together. And Graham says, I have something I'd like to read you from, from Nixon. And I'll try to, I'll, I'll go through the points here. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six points. And his handwriting is written in kind of a shorthand. His handwriting is even worse than mine. Like I can barely read my own handwriting. So I'll, I'll help you struggle through this. So this is from Nixon to LBJ. This is in Graham's handwriting, delivered to Johnson in the Oval Office, that photo I showed you. That, you know, Johnson knew enough to know the photo was, the meeting was important with Graham. He had a whole roll of film taken at a private meeting. Interestingly enough, Johnson's White House taping system was turned off during the meeting. So we don't, as far as we know, there's no recording of it, even though we had that capability. The closest we have to a transcript is, is these notes. So point one, this is Nixon writing in the first person. I will never embarrass him after election. I respect him as a man and as a president. He is the hardest working and most dedicated president in 140 years. And so that was a direct appeal for Nixon to one of LBJ's heroes, Andrew Jackson, in the late 1820s because 140 years would have been 1828 before 1968. Point two from Nixon, I want a working relationship with him, Dash, and will seek his advice constantly. Three, want you to go on special assignments after election, Dash, to foreign countries. Four, must point out some of the weaknesses and failures of the adm abbreviated administration, but will never reflect on Mr. J personally. Point five, when VN, Vietnam, is settled, he, LBJ, uh, Nixon, Nixon will give you, LBJ, a major share of credit because you deserve it. Point six, we'll do everything to make you great in history because you deserve it. And I, I think to this day, I can't tell you there's another time in U.S. history that this activity occurred, you know, between an outgoing wounded president and a, an incumbent who wants his job. I mean, I, I, I either, you, either configuration of parties, either within the same party, I, mean, I, I don't know. This is a fascinating story. And to me, one of the lessons of this book and, and of the class today is really an underlying question. I mean, we, we as Americans are conditioned to learn what political behavior, normal political behavior looks like. Now you could argue in recent years we haven't seen a lot of normal political behavior on either side of the aisle. But we learn, you know, you know Democrats stick with Democrats, Republicans stick with Demo Republicans. We assume they, don't, they aren't really friends anymore. I mean, it used to be, uh, there, I, I read a poll a few years ago of uh, Americans who said, what's the one thing you wouldn't want your son or daughter to do growing up? And it's, you know, marry someone of the other political party is actually high in the list. Um, so we've become, you know, I, I wouldn't say we're as divided as 68. Vietnam, the draft was tearing apart, apart uh, college campuses. A half million soldiers were serving in South, Southeast Asia, including those who were there really against their will in compliance with the draft. We don't have today the degree of violence, uh, the assassinations. We had kind of the summer of George Floyd in 2020, but not quite you know, 100 cities you know, in 68. So it's close. I hope we don't get there, but I don't think we're quite as divided. But in some ways, we are as divided. I mean, that poll that I refer to, no, I don't think people would have said that back then, that, that uh, I don't want my son or daughter to marry someone of the other political party. So maybe in some ways we are as divided or more, but it's, there are differences is what I'm trying to say. 
I don't know of any example like this from U.S. history. And to me, the question is fascinating, as, as we've all learned or just absorbed what normal political behavior looks like, is what happens at key moments in U.S. history if politics is not what we've been told. And that's a fascinating idea that you can project on lots of other periods of history. And I think what you have in 1968 is that Americans watch this chaos play from their living rooms play out on TV, the assassinations, the war, uh, the nightly news had gone from 15 minutes to 30 minutes in 1963. Leave it out, news was still 30 minutes, but really it, it wasn't pretty to watch in much of 1968. At the, the Democrats went to Chicago for their convention that year and the violent protests in which Mayor Daley's police participated in the violence. And whichever Democrat this year thought it was a good idea to go back to Chicago, which they, they are doing later this year, Either you're going after the history or you're unaware of it. Like, I don't think there's really a, a, an in-between position there, but it's gonna be a fascinating convention to watch. It might not be violent on our TV screens, but it might be pretty, you know, energetic, you know, behind the scenes. So Americans watch this in 68 on their television screens. But I think another lesson of 68 is what happens if the chaos of the year reaches even the highest echelons of the political establishment? Well, my answer is, the, the upper echelons of the political establishment alter their normal political behavior in the case of Johnson coming to prefer Nixon. So let's talk about a little bit else. Um, we haven't mentioned many, we've just very briefly had cameos or mentioned others. That kind of sets up the dynamics of the year. It sets up the Johnson-Nixon relationship, Johnson's withdrawal. It sets up the role of Graham throughout, but let's talk about other aspects of the campaign. On the Republican side, you've got a pretty deep bench of people who, you know, oftentimes, just a few years later, we forget who the also-rans were, as we kind of dismiss them as. This was a case of 68, where I think they were more than also-rans. These are people who really could have been president. They either had the, the good looks of a president that we expect them to have, the money, the resources, the connections, the right background, and you can go any one of these, I think, had a real chance. You know, the, the early front runner on the Republican side was Michigan Governor George Romney. At the time, Michigan was considered one of the most important places you could run from, considered a large industrial state. The auto workers and the unions were a much bigger factor back then, even than they are today. It's still a good base to run for pol pol politics, much better then. George Romney in the middle as governor. Uh, there's a lot of pictures I could have chosen, but I chose this one because this is his son Mitt Romney on the left-hand side. So. Uh, it's hard to know whether, are they from Michigan? Are they from uh, Massachusetts? Are they from Utah? Uh, George Romney was actually born in Mexico because he was born during uh, missionary work uh, that, uh, uh, from uh, Mormons in, in Mexico. So uh, Romney is the first one. Again, good looks, money, connected, but, but really makes the mistake of a candidate of peaking too soon. If you kind of come out too early, it gives the media a chance to really feast on you and really study you and do a lot of opposition research against you. So Romney was, really had fizzled out even by the time of the New Hampshire primary had withdrawn and, and was, was gone by New Hampshire. Then you have, uh, and, and Romney, you know, we, we always talk about um, the Republican Party being sort of those conservatives, and it's changing because more conservative Democrats are coming over to the Republican Party. But Romney, like Nixon, was from that sort of moderate to liberal international side of the party. I would put Romney just a hair to the left of, of Richard Nixon. A little bit more to the left than that is New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller. Everything I said about Romney, double it for Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, New York City, uh, uh, so prominent governor of an even bigger state, even more important state, even you know, more resources to run, major political brand name. A lot of Republicans were kind of turned off to him because he'd had a divorce, which is actually controversial back then. And also because in 1960, some Republicans believe that, that Nixon and, and Rockefeller had arranged a kind of backroom deal called the Compact of Fifth Avenue, it was called in the history books. So I, I, you can look that up later. But so conservatives weren't thrilled about, about uh, Rockefeller, but no question he had, he had the resources to go all the way. The trouble is he never did. His pattern was he was sort of in, you know, he was in, he was out, he wasn't really committing to a campaign all the way through, whereas Nixon was in all the primaries beginning in New Hampshire, and the only primary Nixon didn't run in was in California, 
And the reason is because of the next picture I'm going to show you. I had a reporter call me uh, maybe two weeks ago. Actually, I was going up to the Reagan Library to do it. They're just starting to open up the 84 campaign files. And a reporter called me and said, uh, if Gav Gavin Newsom wrote, read your book on 1968, what would you say to him if he called you? And I, I said, I would, I would say to the California governor that you should do exactly what the California governor did in 1968. Uh, which is interesting, another great parallel between the years. California Governor Ronald Reagan. Remember, Nixon lost. Nixon couldn't win in California. But the more conservative Ronald Reagan did uh, after becoming a Republican in 64 and being elected in 66, uh, Reagan was a popular one to, uh, to appear with for, for Nixon. But Nixon didn't want to take him head on. So the California was the only primary that Nixon didn't enter because it would have forced Republicans to take sides. So that's a note. You try not to do that against popular challengers. Uh, Reagan in 68, I think probably like Newsom, uh, although we don't know and might not know for a long time what Newsom's arrangement is with President Biden. Reagan's arrangement with Nixon, as far as we can tell, was that if Nixon didn't have the nomination locked up by Wisconsin, then Reagan was free to move in and challenge him. So Reagan had basically this, this red line uh, that, he, that he had committed to, a kind of quid pro quo with Nixon. And, and Reagan never had to cross that red line because Nixon was so dominant in the early primaries that there was, he, he, by Wisconsin, he, he did have it, it locked up. But this was largely where, where Reagan sat. And you think about it in a way, uh, the, I say, the reason I say Reagan is the model for Newsom is because what, what you don't want to do if you're Reagan in 68 or Newsom in 2024 is you don't want to mortgage your political future, one, because you might have another chance. Wait, choose your timing. You don't need to be in a hurry, although things can change and you might regret not running. And secondly, whatever you do, whether you leave the sidelines and join the race or whether you decide not to run, what you don't want to be is to be blamed by your own party for dividing the party. So those are the two cardinal rules, 1968 for Reagan and for Newsom today, in, in terms of you've got, to have your, you've got to have your red line and you don't want to mortgage your political future, whatever that red line is, and you do not want to be blamed for dividing your party in that year uh, it, it, if things come up. So Reagan ultimately is never a challenger, and I think, I think probably Reagan played it right. He wasn't hurt by a Nixon victory. He ultimately wasn't hurt by a Nixon resignation or by Watergate, and he waited for his timing and ran again in 80 and won. So probably in hindsight, you know, it looks like Reagan probably did the right thing by not running, and I think that's one of the lessons to Newsom is the right thing actually might be not to run. But we'll see. He hasn't called me. If he does, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, Nixon on the issues. Nixon on the issues, again, I would call him kind of a moderate to liberal, moderate to liberal wing, international side of the Republican Party. I think he was probably, in terms of what was he politically, I think he, if you take Nixon and Lodge in 60, and you take Goldwater on the right in 64, Nixon was somewhere in between the two. I think Nixon felt that in 60, he drifted a little too left. Remember, he promised the first African-American in the cabinet if Nixon and Lodge won. I mean, really bold declarations on civil rights at a time when that was still controversial before the 64 Civil Rights Act. Goldwater showed the pendulum went the other way and Republicans got wiped out. So Nixon said, I need to be somewhere in between those two lanes is, the, is where I need to be. So Nixon was really a centrist in 68, the way I look at it. And that allowed Rockefeller and Romney to be on his left it allowed Reagan to be on his right, conceding Nixon the big road in the middle in the party to reach out to both sides. Nixon wasn't loved by liberals in the party and he wasn't loved by conservatives in the party, but he was acceptable to each in 68. Whereas you know, the press, I think, fantasized about a Reagan-Rockefeller dream team running in 68. The problem was their supporters hated each other. You know, they were on opposite ends of the political spectrum, whereas Nixon was acceptable to each you know, as an ambassador to each. Not, not really considered one of each. Plus he'd been out of office for several years, as you know, in the wilderness. But Nixon was acceptable to all parts of the party and can unite it. And to give you an example, um, his, you know, he, he was, Johnson viewed Nixon, so if you're Johnson, why would you prefer Nixon? Why would this make sense? Well, a lot of Democrats in Johnson's own party were pledging to get out of Vietnam within six months, sort of to withdraw, to end the war, and, and pull our troops out. Johnson feared that he would be the first president to be blamed to lose, to lose a war, and he didn't want that part. He felt a lot stronger on, on the domestic part of his legacy, the Great Society, Civil Rights, Voting Acts, 
the, the, the um, LBJ libraries uh, used to sell a t-shirt, I think it still does, in the, in the gift shop when you leave, that has just these words all over the front and back of the shirt. And you look carefully, it's the name of all the legislation that was passed you know, during the Great Society, whether it be the environment, whether it be education, whether it be higher education, or public schools, or Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, I mean, the range of legislation was, was unprecedented and really, in terms of quantity, had surpassed even FDR's New Deal. Uh, I mean, Johnson, I think, felt that John, his goal, only Johnson could set a goal this high, that as president, he wanted to complete not only Kennedy's unfulfilled legacy, which of course is what he did becoming president after Kennedy's assassination, but also in a way completing his hero FDR's unfulfilled legacy. Now, Johnson felt he could do both during his time in office. And so it was an incredible period. And Nixon, in 68, you would expect a Republican to campaign against a lot of that liberal domestic legislation. Nixon really didn't. After, for example, after, um, after King's assassination in April, Nixon gave a prominent speech where I would say, the way I interpret it is he's, he's, he's not saying he's gonna dismantle the Great Society. He's saying he just wants to shade it in kind of a Republican direction. So instead of big welfare programs, he's talking about, he's talking about tax cuts and investment in cities. Uh, instead of uh, big spending bills for education, he's talking about um, improving schools and cities. He's talking about um, uh, community policing. I mean, a lot of later liberals look back at Nixon's rhetoric in this time period, it's surprisingly liberal. And of course, when Nixon becomes president, I don't want to get too, he's not, he's not president yet, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, Nixon no more ends LBJ's great society than Eisenhower did FDR's New Deal. I mean, much to the consternation of conservative Republicans, they didn't. I mean, the size of government under the Nixon administration grew. It didn't shrink. And a lot of what Nixon did as president actually upset conservatives, which is a theme. We'll leave that with you right now. We're gonna come back to that later in the presidency. So on the issues, he was surprisingly moderate. The convention in Miami Beach is actually where, um, uh, actually where the Democrats wish they had moved. Uh, Johnson had locked in Chicago as the site of the convention for the Democrats, which we'll talk about more in just a minute, whereas the Republicans were in Miami Beach, so near Key Biscayne, it was comfortable for Nixon. It was a lot easier, when you choose a convention city, it's also huge questions about security. And when you're in South Florida, like Miami Beach, you can seal off the whole area by closing a couple causeways, if you kind of know that area. So Miami Beach was a much better site. The Democrats, after Johnson withdrew, actually wanted to switch to Miami Beach, so they would both be there but I think Johnson felt he was committed to his friend, Mayor Richard Daley in Chicago. That was, when that, the site was selected, it was, it was intended to coronate Johnson for another nomination, and Johnson felt it'd be too disruptive to change a convention city. So in Miami Beach, Nixon is nominated. Again, the only candidate in the race on both sides who goes all the way, except the California primary, but from the snows of New Hampshire, you know, all the way to, to uh, election day in November, and he chooses in his, a running mate that was at the time controversial and, and people questioned Nixon. He chooses Maryland Governor Spiro Agnew, who only a few years before had been a county commissioner you know, in, in Maryland and had been governor for a couple years. Uh, but actually, you know, in, in hindsight, it, w it, was a, it was a good choice. And I'll tell you why. The, the general thinking, I think it's the same today among nominees, is that the, the, your running mate doesn't really help you. People vote the top of the ticket much more than, than a running mate. But a running mate can hurt you if you don't choose carefully. So you, want, you really want someone who's kind of neutral. And secondly, you want someone who doesn't take the spotlight away from you. You are supposed to be the spotlight on the ticket. And in 60, I think Nixon learned the lesson of Lodge. Lodge was flashier. He was a better dresser. You know, he didn't have the constant five o'clock shadow. I mean, he looked kind of like a Kennedy in that sense. Kind of the chiseled good looks of like a Romney or a Rockefeller. And Lodge did take the spotlight away from Nixon. And that's politically threatening. So you also, thirdly, want to choose someone who's not politically threatening, who's not going to t take not just the spotlight, but not going to challenge your agenda. And so Agnew was enough of an unknown that he really didn't add to the ticket, but he also wasn't seen to really subtract from it either. You know, Lodge added, but Lodge also subtracted in the eyes of the top of the ticket. So I think that's probably why Nixon went for Agnew. Another, another reason I would say too, is Agnew was a major booster of Rockefeller. 
And Rockefeller kept threatening to come back in the race. Agnew was on kind of that moderate to liberal, really even more like liberal side, but was tough on crime because he was, he was from Baltimore. And Baltimore was one of the cities after the King assassination that had a lot of unrest. And so Agnew was kind of a liberal Republican who was tough on the crime and looting and arson and unrest. And that's what Nixon, he was sort of the whole package. He just was still kind of a political unknown. But again, that wasn't bad in the, in the eyes of Nixon. So that was the Republican side of the aisle. And then you get into the fall campaign. What's going on on the Democratic side? The convention in Chicago, which is largely overshadowed by, by the violence and what's going on in Grant Park and other places in Chicago outside of the, the International Amphitheater. Uh, the incumbent vice presidency, Vice President Hubert Humphrey, is really the, the one who has the easiest path to the nomination. And, and why is that? Um, Humphrey was a, was a committed liberal from that side of the party, much more than Johnson. I mean, the 48 convention in Philadelphia, Humphrey boldly declared civil rights as kind of the nation's next major challenge that we should take on. And it caused pandemonium back in 1948 to say that. He said that as the mayor of Minneapolis running for the first time for Senate. He wasn't even in Washington yet. And as, as uh, Johnson's vice president really becomes wedded to the unpopular war in Vietnam. And I, I would, the way I would put it uh, is that he, he did, as vice president, he didn't have Johnson's political assets, but he had his liabilities by the end of, of that term of office. But Humphrey is in the best situation to run as a kind of surrogate for, for Johnson, because back then the rules were different for nominating. Democrats didn't change the nominating process until the results of the McGovern Commission started in 1972. So back in 68, it was really something more like a backroom deal. You didn't need to enter primaries. Humphrey didn't enter any in 68. You didn't need to debate. There weren't any major debates in 68 at all. The only debate there was was McCarthy and Kennedy before the Oregon primary. No other debates that, that fall. And this year, again, we might not have any more debates. We might be done for the year. It's, it's, it's going to be a little different this year. But there is historical precedent for that. Uh, Humphrey also, uh, Johnson, almost every state or county chair, chairman back then would have owed their loyalty to the administration. So once Johnson withdrew and Humphrey is running, that most of that loyalty would shift right to Humphrey. So Humphrey had almost all the delegates he needed without even campaigning, you know, before he even shook a single hand in 68. And sometimes people always say, you know, could Robert Kennedy, you know, have won in 68 had he not been assassinated? Could he have gone to the convention? Like this year again, they're talking about could there be an open convention on either side? And I mean, possibly, I mean, historians aren't supposed to entertain what if questions because that's not what happened, although they're fascinating to think about. But I would go back to the rules the Democrats used. The rules in the Democratic Party to nominate in 68 were really designed to coronate Johnson for another term, not reward an insurgent like a Kennedy or McCarthy. So he might have made it interesting, but it would have been pretty long, long odds, even with Johnson out of the race to topple Humphrey. So Humphrey chooses Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine as his running mate. And Muskie is seen as someone who's sort of calm and stable in a year that doesn't have a lot of calm or stability. He kind of turns the temperature down. Um, he's from Maine, which is kind of historically, even to this day, kind of an independent Republican state, different than conservative, but kind of as a traditional New England Republicanism. Uh, and so he's, so he's considered kind of a swing state, like that could be strategic. Humphrey also liked him because he said that Muskie looks kind of like Abraham Lincoln, and he thought that might be good. I mean, I don't know, use your own judgment on that one. Uh, so that was the, the matchup there on, on the Democratic side of the aisle here at the picture of the convention in Chicago. And then we just got a couple more points here and we'll, we'll wrap it up today. 68 was also, um, gotta get my, cursor in the right place here. 68 was also one of the only campaigns where we had a strong third party challenge, another theme of today. And we don't see this very often as Americans. I don't know about you, but when I go vote, usually the, the top candidates are somewhere at the top. They make it easy to find them, you know, one side or the other. And then I usually at least take a scan. I feel like it's my civic duty to kind of look at who the other candidates are. And I tell you, a lot of times, outside of like the Greens or the Libertarians or one of the more prominent third parties, I don't know who a lot of them are. And maybe you feel the same way. But I at least kind of at least take a look at, at who's, who's down there. We don't see very often that somebody from down there, you know, becomes 
a major candidate who gets kind of pushed up in the public light. The last time we had this was probably Ross Perot in 92 or 96, who polled as high as 39%, and, but, but not, didn't win any electoral votes. Remember, our elections are settled in the Electoral College. <coughs> Wallace was the last major challenge where somebody ran, got on the ballot in all 50 states, and won electoral votes. Wallace polled as high as 23% in 68, and he won 10 million votes and, and did win electoral votes, enough to kind of change the outcome. And so if you have a third party candidate, I think most of the time you're not gonna, you're, you don't think you have a chance to win, but you wanna play spoiler. You might be able to cut a deal with one side or the other. You might be able to deny a victory in some states that might be enough overall as a goal. And so I think Wall that was really Wallace's strategy. What, the, reason, the second reason Wallace is important today is because if you're running as a third party candidate or no labels or whatever it becomes, you really have to study the Wallace playbook. Wallace got on the ballot in all 50 states. He, everywhere but District of Columbia kept him out. And I always joke, there's not a lot today that brings Republicans and Democrats together in a moment in Washington. Probably concern over China, concern over social media, and concern over third party challenges in your state. It's going to bring those two parties. To, there's one thing they can agree on is neither side wants third party challenges because you never know who are they going to draw more from. Is it going to help you or hurt you? And that's a real gamble. Better off just not to have them is what both parties collude uh, in most states. Wallace is really the first modern candidate to run in all 50 states who ran effectively an anti-elite, anti-establishment, anti-media campaign. And so that has huge resonance to recent politics. As far as I know, the phrase drain the swamp never occurred to George Wallace, but if it did, he would have used it. I mean, that was pretty much his campaign. You know, stand up for the little guy, you know, against the power structure. He was, he was a, at that point, he was a lifelong Democrat. He had made clearly kind of racist statements in 1962, threatening to personally block integration at the University of Alabama it, when, it, when that were to occur. In 63, in his inaugural address, he stood in the same spot where Jefferson Davis stood in Montgomery and proclaimed segregation today, tomorrow, and forever. But by 68, he was, the version here, he was really more of a kind of Huey Long inspired kind of Southern populist who was trying to develop a national message that would work beyond Alabama and beyond the South. Uh, and so Wallace is fasting for lots of reasons. You know, you, he, he ran as a third party in 68 because he wanted to be free to criticize both major, uh, both major parties and later becomes a Republican, like, like millions of, of Democrats in the South. And his running mate is Curtis LeMay, who is criticized as running, uh, uh, nicknamed Bombs Away LeMay for his uh, uh, casual suggestion of the use of atomic weapons. He was probably most famous for the firebombing of Tokyo and other Japanese coastal cities in World War II, but actually probably during the Cold War had done more than anyone else to keep us out of a World War III being in charge of strategic air command and kind of being in charge of the, really those weapons during the Kennedy and Johnson years. So LeMay is an odd choice to be drafted to run. He, he said he was probably gonna vote for, for Nixon, but, but that's, that's the, the way he configured it. He's considered kind of a, 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 still a wartime hero and bolster the foreign policy credentials of the Wall Assad. Yeah, go ahead. Um, do you think the choice of the vice presidential candidates, Muskie or Agnew, were in any way made to Uh, I mean, possibly, uh, except um, uh, Wallace had made the selection of May, uh, LeMay after the other two parties chose theirs. So Wallace was really the last one to decide and, and choose his own. Wallace had trouble finding anybody who wanted to run with him. And so he went through several options before he finally got to LeMay, and LeMay resisted. But the, uh, the, the Republicans that had their convention first, and then uh, just as this year, typically the, the incumbent party goes second on the conventions. So even this year, Republicans go first in July. Democrats don't go until about the third week of August this year. And where uh, Wallace came out, Wallace didn't, didn't come out and announce LeMay until October 3rd in Pittsburgh. And so he was, he was much, much later you know, than the others. So there might have been a little you know, concern about that, but Wallace actually was the one that had the final say you know, that, can, that campaign. And the last thing we'll talk about and then wrap up in the election result, much has been written about 68 as, as uh, the question has been raised, you know, did Nixon collude with South Vietnam to steal the election from Lyndon Johnson? Peace talks have been going on in Paris since May, which really hadn't gone anywhere. 
And the central figure in all of this is a, a woman named Anna Chenault, a, a Chinese American whose family had lost everything in China in the late 1940s during com communist takeover and when the PRC began in October 1st, 1949. Pictured here in her Watergate penthouse, which is where I, I met her in 2017 to, to talk about this uh, and, and this, this part in the book. And the story is that she was a go-between between, between Nixon and uh, South Vietnamese President Nguyen Van Thieu, that, that she had promised to you that under a Nixon presidency, Vietnam would get a better deal. We wouldn't cut and run. We wouldn't abandon you. And it, it, it makes for a pretty good story. The problem is the evidence is actually pretty thin of all that. So I kind of, I, I have a whole appendix in the book where I go through the, what's, what we know and what we don't know. But at the very final weeks of the campaign, there were allegations that Chenault had acted as a go-between, between, again, candidate Nixon to undermine Johnson's peace talks to get the cooperation of, of an ally, South Vietnam, to state its preference for Nixon or to refuse to take part in Johnson's peace talks. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story that had new legs after 2016 when allegations of did, did Trump, did candidate Trump collude with Russia to, so that Putin could signal his preference for Trump uh, and, and effectively steal an election. So this is not the first time this has happened. 1980, there was a similar version of Reagan. Did Reagan, did Reagan cooperate with Iran behind the scenes to make sure the hostages weren't released right before the election, which would have given a boost to Carter? Uh, again, the evidence, I would say, is, is pretty thin. The election result, it was a close election. Nixon won by about a half million votes in 1968. The Electoral College was a little more decisive. Not a landslide, but a little more decisive, especially when you factor in Wallace's 46 electoral votes that he got that year. So in effect, if you kind of add Nixon plus Wallace and interpret that to be kind of the anti-incumbent vote, it's a much more decisive uh, election that year. But what I would leave you with is one final thought. Nixon might be the winner, but Nixon, millions of people voted for Nixon, not because they, they loved him, but because, go back to what I said before, because he was acceptable. He was the, the, the least bad of the alternatives. He was a way to kind of rewind the clock and choose someone who whose political office and career was before Vietnam, before the unrest and chaos of the country. And so Nixon was really the best of the alternatives. But Nixon coming into office in 68, not owing any political favors to anybody because he was out of office for six years, would really have to try to build a majority and a, and a base of support that most candidates have automatically on January 20th when they're sworn in. And Nixon would have to work really hard to have that. And so it, right from the beginning of Nixon's presidency, the idea of living with you, there's sort of tension in the Oval Office. The first president since 1840, not to have the House or the Senate controlled by his own party. So all five and a half years of Nixon's presidency would have to involve cooperation and compromise. So he is, he'll be the president, and we'll pick that up next time. But, but again, right from the beginning, a lot of tension in the country. And it's also not clear exactly how he's going to govern with a majority for those five and a half years. So we'll see you then. Thanks for listening to this week's Lectures in History podcast. To find even more history content, visit c-span.org slash AHTV.